<laughs> Welcome to Visual Church. One of the things I like, especially on Wednesday nights, is this layman's Bible study notebook we've been using. Now, we did recommend that you don't have to use this. You don't have to go out and buy one because we're putting everything on the video itself so that you can see the questions. You know, you can hear them, you can replay, you can use your smart device, your phone, your iPad, your computer, or whatever technical or technology that you're using in order to view these, then you can also use these. Because you see, it's not necessary, especially within the, the church age, to have to spend money in order to study. That's stupid. We shouldn't have to pay for learning about God. One of the things that I've never agreed with was the whole idea that you have to pressure people into giving money. As far as we're concerned at Video Church, freely you receive, freely given, you can't give to us. As a matter of fact, we provide everything for you so that you can't and you won't and you don't give anything. Except maybe you choose to use your time according to your own decision. So if you allow yourself a certain amount of time to watch and to read and to study with video, then praise the Lord. That's up to you. But you see, that's why we do this, so that you can do it at your own time, at your leisure, whenever you choose between you and God to study and to understand, to comprehend and to learn. So really in this New Testament that we're using, this Layman's Parallel Bible Study Notebook, as you heard last week, the first part of the service, we would do the homework. You know, that little homework assignment we gave you of all these questions we read last week. And we are in attempting to host them, and I think that you'll see them right now where my hands are maybe already typed up, or maybe not. <laughs> We're winging it when we first get started, so the first few videos usually are a little rusty. But then we get rolling along, it gets better. So. What we're going to do in this first initial part of video, the Wednesday night service, is we're just going to go through the homework. We're not going to get into the next chapter yet, which is the uh, chapter 2, and it'll be verses 1 through 12, I guess. But let's get into the homework, because they're always interesting, the questions, and then sometimes the responses are different. I mean, if, if we were out there at, you know, North Salt Lake down the street and, you know, sitting at the, unfortunately it'd be really hot in the cement right now, but, you know, sitting in the amphitheater, then we go ahead and just read them out loud and talk back and forth and, you know, kind of compare and understand it. It's no wrong answers, but there are only right answers. Just the way you understand it is the way you answer. And that's kind of what teaching is all about. It's not about someone getting checked off their right answers or wrong answers or 50% right or getting a smiley or a frowny or whatever you get, but rather it's a process of development, of educating ourselves, of learning something that we want to know in a more intimate and personal way. And in this case, that knowing something else is someone else, Jesus. So let's look at the first question that we're in in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. And the first question is, what reasons would there be for a gospel writer to record the names of Jesus' ancestors? Well, <laughs> call me stupid, but my first thought was, so you know where he came from. <laughs> now, I know you're thinking Immaculate Conception out there, but, I mean, really. Genealogy, or his lineage in this case, I think they use the word, oh, ancestors, ancestors. So if they don't say it's a genealogy, and they don't say it's a lineage. Good choice, because sometimes... The things that are recorded aren't every ancestor, but are the highlights. It's particularly in Matthew when there are three sets of seven. But one of the reasons that I think that there would be for a gospel writer to record the names of Jesus is because each ancestor epitomizes something about the character and the nature of what God is trying to reveal in his son. They each seem to have a part of being the formation character of his nature. As a matter of fact, we know that in the Torah, or in the first five books of the Bible, as it were, in Jewish canon, as we call it the canon in Christian circles, as they have codified the first five books and call it the Torah, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 
we know that recorded there, or in, I should just, yeah, in Exodus, that, maybe it's later in Ezra, but anyways, in Exodus it also talks about that the ancestors had to have a lineage. They had to be able to keep track of who married who, and whose lineage was of a certain type so that they could be in the Levitical order, or the Aaronic priesthood, or they had to prove that they were of the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, because of that, Jesus really had to demonstrate that he could be accepted as a Jew. And to this day, there's still that argumentation about going on about who could prove who's Jewish. Well, the old joke was when in Jewish culture, they'd say, you, a Jew? I mean, that was a joke. But now with the heret with the genomes or gene with studying the genetic markers that are in our our DNA, we're able to determine sometimes pretty accurately. I won't say 100% because I'm sure they're going to find out that they're inaccurate on some areas and occasions. We're pretty much able to determine who is Jewish and who isn't, just within a certain amount of parameters and a certain amount of accuracy. So I would say that really the reason why the gospel writer was recording the names of Jesus' ancestors to prove he's a Jew. I mean, prove that he's a son of Abraham, a son of Isaac, a son of Jacob, that he can be or he would fulfill the destiny of being a Messiah, of being the Christ. And that may be the real reason why, and I would probably put that down as the number one answer. Um, the real reason why his ancestors are recorded in order to prove he's the Messiah. Now, moving on to number two, since I haven't written down a whole bunch, but I just gave you three different answers, or maybe four if you really paid attention. Looking at the second question, Rahab, in verse 5, was a harlot, according to Hebrews 11.31, and David was a king, in verse 6, but he committed sins of murder and adultery. Both were ancestors of Jesus. What does this teach you? Well... I would say that a lot of the reality of our parents, while we're told in Exodus that, or we're told in um, Genesis, but we're told that in the law that the sins of the father would visit down to the third and fourth generation, I would look back and see how many generations there was because it could be there's a generational thing going on that maybe is passed down to Jesus, only it wasn't. So maybe that's not as accurate as we think it is, or is it? The other part of the answer I would say would be that God has a tendency, if you look at anything that's involving His will, He doesn't necessarily look at things the same way we do. He doesn't look for a perfect ancestry in order to be the fulfillment of the promise that He was giving to the children of Israel. As a matter of fact, He said that when you make this agreement to be my people, I know you will break it, and I will take care of that. We don't see that necessarily as a promise of God given to us in the garden. But in the garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve committed sin before God or separated themselves from God by rebellion against what God had said, he kind of said something there that was a prophecy that the, the seed of the woman would eventually bruise the head of the serpent. And in some ways, when you study these things in depth, you begin to see that genealogy being worked out through the process of time that eventually when you come to Jesus you kind of see the fulfillment of that promise that's another kind of obscure answer I would say that would be a part of um, a teaching that would come out of looking at Jesus ancestry now looking specifically at Rahab I would say that between David and Rahab, we see the marriage of the Jew and the Gentile. You see, Rahab was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew. You know, she had basically, you know, come from, uh, you know, been a prostitute in Jericho. And she helped the spies that, you know, had come into Jericho by crawling over the wall and hid them. And they had promised her that they, she would be saved. Well, little did anyone realize that salvation would have been not just that temporary salvation from the immediate problem of Jericho going to be destroyed and that her house would be spared, but also salvation to her generations. Her family lineage would go on. And that's what's amazing about what God can do. On the one hand, we see a promise for an immediate answer, 
But the long-term effect of that answer also can extend beyond what we ever dreamed God had planned or had intended. The same thing is true about David. While David was king, and he was a man after God's own heart, the promise that God had given him didn't end because he sinned or didn't end because he committed adultery or even murder. Rather, we see that even though they were both sinners, God could still save them and God could still use them. That's a demonstration in some ways of grace. That it's by his mercy we are not consumed. By his grace he forgave them. By his forgiveness he demonstrates his loving kindness. So those words are used in the Old Testament more than the New Testament. Things like loving kindness, mercy, and, and um, forgiveness, but not grace. You don't hear the word grace, but you see the demonstration of grace through those words and what actions he did with these people. So those would be the answers that I would give. Now, you may have something different, and I would implore you to choose different answers that are simpler and easier to understand. What does the name Jesus mean? That's a good question. You see, if you just went by the name Jesus, it would be Greek. And because it's Greek, I'd have to answer, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> dumb, dumb, dumb. But seriously, the name Jesus is a name that was given because Jewish people would, in the time of Jesus, not only speak Hebrew, but also be able to speak Greek, because the Greeks had come centuries before and had attacked Israel, and most Jewish people were trained in more than one language, even to this day, can usually speak two or three, but the nation itself was on the crossroads, and specifically being on the Mediterranean, it would have been a, a, a language of commerce, much like, you know, how you say, you know, the dollar speaks, or, you know, English is the, the language of commerce, or people learn Japanese so they can deal with Japan as an exporter of a certain amount of goods and services. And some that people now do the same thing with Chinese. But at the time of Jesus, his name was Jesus, but his Hebrew name really conveys the meaning that I think the Bible study is trying to get across. And his Hebrew name was Joshua. Now, you don't normally think of Jesus as being Joshua, because Joshua is the English version of the Hebrew name that Jesus comes from. Jesus is the English version of the name from the Greek that the name Jesus comes from. His actual name is Yehoshua. And then it makes perfect sense, at least to a Jew. Now, Yehoshua is God of salvation, or yud heh vav -Hey, Yahweh, is salvation. Well, okay, that makes sense. God is salvation. That being said, then we see that Yehoshua is Joshua, because there's no J in Hebrew. And so, Using the Y that it normally is in Hebrew, then you begin to see Yehoshua as Joshua or Yeshua as Jesus. Now, Yeshua is kind of a, a pet name. It's kind of a mixture between Hebrew and colloquialism, colloquial Hebrew, and kind of Aramaic a little bit. Kind of a mixture thing. And everybody has those, you know, pet names, you know. Yeshua would have been his pet name or his familiar name, his family name. Yehoshua ben Yosef would have been, or Yehoshua ben David, would have been his formal name that he would have been addressed in the synagogue or in the temple. In the temple, as he presented himself to the priest, he would have had to have given his entire lineage, and it would have been Yehoshua ben Yosef ben 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 ben, 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 ben son of son of son of son of. You know, begat, 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 begat. You get the picture there. So that's why it has all these recorded, because in reality, this is the same thing he would have said verbally to the priest as he presented himself in the temple. The record that we have in Matityahu, the Hebrew way of saying Matthew. So you see, there's always an interesting thing about learning other languages and discovering another way of saying the same word. Sometimes the meaning is a little more clear. That's why it's Yahweh, or yud heh or yud you know, without having syllables, but, uh, yeah, there we go, and, you know, it's just breath, I mean, really, without saying syllabics, 
you don't get into this, you know, holy name thing. It's not true. It's all phony. It's just you hey Buffett. It's like saying Jehovah only Jehovah instead of the J or the Y. And the reason they threw the J in wasn't because they were corrupted or weird or being obnoxious. It's just it was easier for Germans to say a J than a Y. Just like sometimes there's other cultures that have a hard time with our language. Same thing was true. So that's what the name Jesus means. Now it's interesting that the prophecy that was given with it, with his name was said that you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's the interesting thing about God is salvation as far as his name is concerned. It applies. Just like in my name, um, it's always interesting for me, is Michael, which means um, who is like another God. There's one complete sentence in my first name, and that's it. Who is like another God. Now my formal Hebrew name would have been... Um, Michael Yaakov ben Avraham, or Michael Yaakov Ibn Michael Ibn Michael Yaakov, you know, and that would have been, you know, the Ben Israel. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can do your name. It all depends on what your common name is being used as. Like I went by Ibn Abraham lots of times when I was dealing in, in Hebrew and dealing with people that were in the Messianic movement, but. Normally it would have been Michael Yaakov Ibn, because Ibn is stone, and Yaakov is Jacob, or James, and Michael is, is uh, Michael. And so, you know, that would have been my name. Now, I always say Michael Yaakov Ben Abraham, because it's the son of Abraham. You know, I have faith in Jesus, so I always put the, the attenation of the son of Abraham at the end of it. And then my filial name, or family name, would have been Ibn Abraham. So, anyways, long kind of like Hebrew kind of word study. The reason why we're saying that is because we're going to deal with the Greek in the next question. So now the next question asks, how does the name Emmanuel or Emmanuel? Because oftentimes one of the things that we don't do in English that we should do probably to be proper is that most languages around the world are phonetically sounding. They are a, e, e, o, u. So whenever you see a vowel, it's a a, an e, a e, a o, or a u. Not a a, a, e, e, i, e, a, i, e, o, o, and u, silent or something. I don't know. I can't remember all the English ones. But, you know, cause we, we do all messed up things in English. So, usually when you see a word, you can kind of like get a handle on it by in E man, E man, E man, well. And the L is always got at the end, you know, it's kind of got a little good there. So, how does the name Emmanuel relate to the trust of salvation taught by the name Jesus? Well, Emmanuel means God with us. I mean, let's just keep it short right now. So, if trust of salvation is taught by the name Jesus, which means God is salvation, that God is salvation by God with us, or God in us. So it could be God with us, or it could be God in us. And a lot of times, you know, you kind of go there. Interesting kind of teaching there, too. But it would be God in us and God with us. So God with us, Jesus, or Jesus with us. Jesus has become with us, in us, full us, filling us, and becoming one with us. It's an interesting teaching because it's got to go into John and it gets even weirder and more, and more out there. But you can take it as surface level as you want or as deep as you want. There's a lot there that you can learn from just the two words, Emmanuel and Jesus. Jesus, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Jesus. Or you can do a whole long word study on all the names of Jesus and find out all kinds of things that are really interesting. The Son of Man, the Son of David, the Son of God. Why is he called all these sons? Interesting. Because he fulfills them. He does those ministries. And they are all, they are all separate ministries. Now, what spiritual lessons does this passage teach you? Well, I like to leave that alone in some ways because we're going to get into some other things that are questions that are a little more detailed on some aspects of this study in dealing with answering the questions at times as the Spirit of God gives inspiration for it. Right now, I don't want to push too much the spiritual lessons because... I'd rather get going in Matthew a little bit before we 
sense that the Spirit of God would be giving you the answers and revealing to you something specific. Although there's a lot here to be said. And we might come back to the beginning after we get into maybe at the baptism of Jesus when he gets the Holy Spirit poured upon him without measure. Then maybe we'll come back and look at this. So moving over to the next side of our homework assignment, we have Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. And now we're looking specifically at the scriptures, asking questions according to the portion of the, in Hebrew they call it the Parsha, that's why I always go portion, because I want to say Parsha. In the portion that we're reading, or the segment, or the section that we're reading, there really isn't chapters in Hebrew. There really isn't sections that are lined out like you do in the books with, you know, reading a verse. You, you memorize chapter and verse and you don't need to. It's not there. It won't be there. I'm sorry. It won't be there in Hebrew. It won't be there in heaven. Not because Hebrew is spoken in heaven, but just because it won't be needed. There's not really a need for the numbers and the chapters. But looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, the question is posed, how far back in ancestry does this go? Well, in Matthew, this goes back to the genealogy that we're given, as we read in verse 1, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Right there, we give the clue, son of David, son of Abraham. It's going to cover those two. So we read the first uh, indication in chapter 1, verse 2 is the answer. Abraham was the father of Isaac. So the farthest back that the list goes is Abraham. Now Abraham is the one who God called out of Ur of Chaldees from being Abram and gave him a new name and said, I would raise unto you a people. And I would bless these people and you would be the father of many nations and that you would be the, whether we understand or not, the father of faith. You know, we look at that in Hebrews when we look back and we see that. But Abraham really is the start. It's, you know, you got a lot before that, but really Abraham is where the Jewish nation begins, where actually you could say, this is a Jew, or better yet, this is an Israeli, or this is a child of the one true king or the one true God. There's a lot of different titles that were used in the old days to follow that theme, but sometimes in modern theology it gets mixed up so that they create dogmas and doctrines. So I don't want to do that because some of the cults pick on those names and use them for themselves. So the answer is Abraham, and why would this be a special interest to a Jewish reader? And, you know, I looked at this because somebody wrote in there, but, the, you know, it's called the fulfillment of prophecy. Well, that's part of the answer, but Abraham really is the patriarch that you always go back to who began and then extend forward, you know, and each one adds something to it. It's like in Hebrew, there's the thought that everyone stands on the shoulders of someone else. You're not, you know, head and shoulders above everyone else. You're standing on someone else's shoulders. In other words, you're learning on someone else's experiences. You're learning life by someone else having gone through life. And so Abraham would have been the first one of the nation, and at the same time, the fulfillment of the prophecy. God promised him, God fulfilled in him, God demonstrated, and then God used him in ways to prove to us that he is God. Actually uses Abraham a lot like a complete Christian life, because in the same way that Abraham made mistakes, screwed up, went the wrong way, went the right way, made this error in judgment, made that one, and you know had consequences for it, it's fulfilling of also us today, how we live our lives, even though we have the Spirit of God. Deportation to Babylon in verses 11, 12, and 17 was God's judgment for Israel's sin. Why does Matthew even emphasize this era? It speaks of... Well, whoops, I was reading somebody else's answer. Deportation to Babylon was God's judgment for Israel's sin. Why does Matthew even emphasize this era? Well, Babylon... You know, there's, there's two big indications of God judging Israel, Egypt and Babylon. Now, God judged the world by causing a famine to come upon the world, and so Israel was driven into Egypt in order for God to demonstrate His power and His might to the children of Israel and then set them apart from the other nations of the world, that He would call them to be His own. 
and he did that through that conflict between Moses and Egypt, between Jacob, the children of Jacob and the children of the world, or the Egyptians. And you see that conflict going on even to this day. You will see at odds the two nations fighting and warring among themselves, the Arab nations and the children of Israel. Twelve sons of each. Didn't know there were twelve on the Arab side, did you? There were. So, it is interesting that in Babylon, though, we see a whole different story being made obvious to us. God had blessed the children of Israel. God had brought them into the land. God had promised them to, to go through these things. But he said, don't forget me. And they did. He said, don't do these things. And they did. He told them what would happen if they did. And they did have it happen, Babylon. So they get pulled away because God wanted to demonstrate to us the same thing. Today, we see the same effect happening to us. In reality, the world could have been so much better had we done what we're told to do. Babylon represents a lot. Babylon is a commercial system. Babylon isn't like America today. Rome is more like America today, but Babylon isn't. Babylon was the first world empire that would control the world without having God at its center. It would be the first empire that would be technically ruled by Satan himself because Satan gives over the kingdoms of this world that they were given unto Satan to control and to rule. So, Babylon also demonstrates how you could live in the world and not be of the world. And so we see a lot about this, this just the word Babylon that we can learn from and develop our own Christian life from. Just the whole experience the children of Israel went through in Babylon. There's a huge history there of what happened with the nation Israel that we can be blessed by and apply to our lives, like Daniel and the children of Meshach, Daniel's friends, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Ishael, Ishael, and Azariah. But anyways, getting into the next question, chapter 1, verse 18 through 21, what part did each play in Jesus' birth? Mary? Well, Mary was a mother, but she was more than that, so we'll just say mother for now. The Holy Spirit? He was the instigator and the, crea the creator of life in preparing a body for him that was fashioned so that he could occupy it. And that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. She it was like a P as opposed to a me, and they get into all these words. But anyways, if, for that, was, that was just a sideline for some of those that get into that. But really, the Holy Spirit was the power of God in Jesus to do what Jesus could do. He couldn't have done it of his own flesh because he was human. But when he trusted in the Holy Spirit to fulfill in him, oh, at Jesus' birth, never mind. The simple answer is just simply, the Holy Spirit caused the gestation of the egg to become a living being. Joseph was the father, they want to put under the law here, but Joseph was his father by way of right, privilege, and according to the traditions of the land. He was the father that provided a home, a house, a living, and did everything that a father does by way of the spirit of adoption in the same way that we're adopted unto God by faith, so too Jesus' Father in the same way was a type and a fulfillment of prophecy that the, by adoption we would be brought into as Gentiles or as Jews into the family of God, not by just birthright. And that's the way it would be with Joseph, is that it was Joseph was the father, so it would have been passed through him. But he's not blood relative, he's relationship by instigation of the Holy Spirit, God doing it. By whom had Jesus been conceived? Obviously the Holy Spirit. In verses 1 through 20 or 122, what name was to be given the virgin's child? And we're told in verse 22, if we look at it, just quoting it would be just as easy. He shall and he, she shall bring forth the son and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So what name shall be given the virgin's child? Jesus. This person wrote the wrong one in there, but it was kind of interesting. She didn't look up 22, so she wrote Emmanuel. Well, it doesn't say Emmanuel. It says Jesus in verse 22. So be careful of that when you're doing your homework. Don't make the mistake. It's real simple. Easy mistake to make. She wrote it off of memory, not off of reading. 
What did his name mean literally? Well, again, it means God or yud heh vav yud Yehovah, Yehovah, is salvation. God is salvation. It's from Isaiah 7, 14, part of the fulfillment of virgin, shall conceive and bear a child, but it was. So in, the next question would be, the last one, would be in verse 1, tw verses 24 and 25, how do these verses emphasize Joseph's obedience? And verse 24 and 25, says that after Joseph, I mean, previous to that, it says, the, I was say, yeah, okay. In previous verses, like back up in 18 and then read it downward, you'll see that Joseph was given a dream and in the dream that he had an angel appear to him and the angel himself, I believe it was Gabriel, if I see it there, I'll say that it's Gabriel, but if I don't see it, I'll just say it's an angel of the Lord. So it was an angel of the Lord. I'm not finding it real quick. But basically, the angel himself spoke to David, spoke to Joseph in a dream, and assured him and reassured him, because in those days, Israel was used to seeing angels. I mean, frankly, you know, Elizabeth and the nephew, or Elizabeth, excuse me, I've got my foot stuck. <laughs> but Zechariah and Elizabeth basically had a child and he was remained dumb because the angel appeared to him and told him to have a child. You know, said his name would be him. He didn't speak until the baby was born. <coughs> Excuse me. And then said his name would be John. Well, Israel loved following angels. I mean, people today love to follow angels. There's Catholics that love following angels. There's Protestants that love following angels. I mean, there's even, you know, other religions that follow angels. And so, Israel was just like everybody else, you know, when you, they heard an angel, they saw an angel, they believed the angel, you know, they would do whatever an angel said. Unfortunately, Paul had to bust a lot of people in the book of Hebrews about following angels because there was a greater than an angel, and that's Jesus. Jesus is not an angel. Satan is a fallen angel. Demons are fallen angels. That's all. So, really, after having this dream and seeing this angel, then what the angel told Joseph in the dream it's funny because his name is Joseph, and it's just like Joseph, the other Joseph, having a dream. So you kind of go back in the Old Testament, and right now, with the birth of Jesus, find a similarity, and you can find a lot of continuity. But in the same way, having a dream and knowing that the angel spoke to him, he got up, and by obedience, raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus because he had the right, and he had the privilege, and he had the ministry of doing that unto his son. So when he gave the name, he gave his stamp seal of approval to the marriage. When he took Mary under his household, then she was literally married unto him permanently. So in the outline that we have also of the homework, we have as the first part, Number one, ancestors, Abraham to David, and that kind of extends all the way down from verses 1 through verses 6. Then we have David to Babylon in verses kind of 6-ish, all the way down to verse 12. From Babylon to Christ, we have verse 12 all the way down to verse 17. Then there's kind of a, they mentioned there's a summary, and we go from verse 17 to verse 18. And then we have a second section that's called Angel's Word, which is kind of weird, but it's his outline. And verse 18 through verse 22, and then we have a third section called Prophecy, and it's verse 22 through 24, and then last part we have a number four, it's Fulfillment in the outline, and it goes from 24 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 25. Now, the outlines are interesting. You know, people do outlines for whatever reasons they want to. They're keywords, buzzwords, interesting words, all kinds of different things. You know, you can circle and do, you know, expositional, intentional, inductive, didactive, intuitive, sim symbiotic, and symbolic. But I have my own way, which is called integral specificity, and that simply says that the the integrity of the scripture is such that the Spirit of God can make this be the Word of God for you because it's not just written in such a way that it doesn't have errors, but it does. So that 
in each integer of that specificity, it is written there for that specific purpose that God wanted it there, and it is interlocuted in a locational basis so that you cannot destroy or convert or subvert the Word of God. It will always come through as being God's Word, spoken and recorded and written to us so that we can allow the Spirit of God to speak to us through it, no matter what version you use. Integral specificity. So that's the end of the homework section of this Bible study. And we have yet to get into the study itself. So you can see that these studies are going to be rather long, a little drawn out, a little bit time consuming, but you'll get a lot out of them if you do your homework and then prepare yourself to study as you learn and apply the Word of God in your life, doing the will of God by reading and applying the Bible as the Spirit of God breathes life into it to make it to you, God's Word spoken and alive and quicken unto you, so that you would know the Word and be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God in Christ Jesus, not just to know the Bible or know some quote or scripture or memorize it, but rather you'll begin to do it and understand it and be able to understand the concepts and the principles and the reality of what parts are important and what parts really aren't. And there are lots of parts that really aren't that important. As a matter of fact, there's whole specific sections that could probably just be, you know, said, hey, I'm not Jewish, I'm not dealing with it. And yet God will speak to you through it, and I'll show you that when we get to it. But in the meantime, I pray that the Lord would bless you. with peace, not just with frustration, aggravation, or homework, but rather to begin to learn these things and to enjoy them for what they are. It's meant to be a Bible study. That's why Wednesday nights, we don't do it for casual conversation. This isn't just simply, simply something that you can just say, hey, I'm just going to grab it and go. No, we've got studies for that. If you want to grab and go, you know, just a little quick word, you know, get video. You know, you can Google it and find it. But if you really want to get into in-depth, you know, as we're doing, then stick with us on Wednesday nights, because every Wednesday night we're going to give you homework assignments. And then the next week we will follow up and go through it to begin with, with the homework assignment. And I think we're going to separate the videos so that way it's not all crammed into one and become three hour long Bible study. But we'll do the homework assignment first and then end it. And then you can you know review it if you want to and then get right into the Bible study. So just so you know it's out there, this is the homework assignment from week one. So, be blessed, watch for, we'll record and we'll put out the, the um, week two homework assignment and Bible study together. And it's short, so you'll see that it's shorter. It may only be a couple hours. <laughs> Won't be all night long like I can do. But, you know, I mean, at least you get off easy this time, or at least the next one you will. So, God bless you. I pray that you begin to learn on your own what you can do and teaching and allowing the Spirit of God to lead you in a way that He can provide for you an education as opposed to sitting and listening to some man talk and not be able to ask the questions you want to ask. If you come live and we're outside at the public venue or even if you come and visit us in the home, we do stop studies in the middle of them and discuss it, talk about it, ask questions, see what you have to say, even let you read it, you teach. You'd be surprised. That is the way it should be. But that's not the way it always will be. It's not the way that it always has been. But it is the way that we do it at the Church. Church. So, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord, my God, lift up His countenance upon you and not just give you peace, but reveal to you His Son so that you can know Jesus in such a personal intimate way that you would run to your Father in Heaven. And thank you.